um, Professor Her Jan van der Heyden. Uh, professor van der Heyden is Professor of Metaphysics and Philosophical Anthropology at Radabout University in Nijmegen. And he examines problems from metaphysics and ontology in the light of recent developments in phenomenology, hermeneutics and contemporary French thought, and is interested in the motive of speaking for the other in hermeneutics. He studies how the concept of contingency determines the landscape of contemporary ontology and speculates upon why the letters of St. Paul are so often read in contemporary philosophy. Indeed, I've wondered about that myself from Taubes to Badu. But today he will address us on a topic close to my own heart, a hermeneutical phenomenology and offering an approach that I, I think has wider applicability beyond Christianity. Uh, the title of his lecture is Engaging and Disengaging Religion, a Hermeneutic Phenomenological Approach. Professor van der Heiden, over to you. And we'll, we'll go into the break for five minutes, it's fine. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much, um, Gavin, for the kind introduction and uh, for setting up this, uh, this excellent uh, conference. Um, I'll try to um, speak indeed on the idea of a hermeneutic phenomenological approach to religion based on Heidegger and uh, Rieke. I use these authors as a kind of frame of reference to rethink what the phenomenology of religion uh, might be doing. Um, there are important resources available in 20th century hermeneutic phenomenology uh, that might be helpful for the project as described in the introduction or the statement of this conference, um, namely in which sense might the phenomenology of religion contribute to or even be a philosophical anthropology, and how would such an invigoration of this phenomenology relate to the three lines of critique that have been stated. So the three critiques that have stifled the project of a phenomenology of religion can perhaps be divided in two kinds. The first two, the social cultural uh, constructivist and the neuroscientific account of religion are reductionist in the sense that they do not take internal claims of religion seriously. Whereas the third line of critique concerning the theological turn in phenomenology tends to mobilize this phenomenology for a particular religious outlook that might run the risk of losing the descriptive value and the agnostic or secular stakes of a phenomenology of religion. And this then leads to a double task, I think, for a renewal of the phenomenology of religion. On the one hand, in order to counterbalance the first two critiques, the engagement with religious experience is required, that is, an interpretation of its possible contribution to the question of what the human is and what the human place in the world is. And on the other hand, in order to counterbalance the third critique, a detachment from a particular religious investment is required. And additionally, such a task requires, it seems to me, a, a double type of answer, uh, because it is a question concerning both method and content. First, phenomenology is the name of a particular method. A new version of a phenomenology of religion cannot simply mean to overrule the aforementioned critiques. It must take them into account and show that they either express fundamental concerns about the fabrication of religious experience in its social, cultural, and historical dimensions, or that argue that a particular sense of this religious experience cannot simply be accessed without an affirmation of the religion to which this experience belongs. Second, a method is not developed for its own sake. I hope you're not hearing the alarm bells that are going off right now at 12 o'clock every first Monday of the month. It will take a couple. Can you still hear me? Then I will speak on. Okay, good. <laughs> So second, um, a method is not developed for its own sake. It is always a response to the way in which a particular subject matter gives itself to be understood. And in this particular sense, the phenomenological study of the content of religious experience 
must show what it has to offer to a philosophical conception of the human self. Um, and as I said, I think that Heidegger and Ricoeur might be two interesting resources from 20th century hermeneutic phenomenology uh, that might help us to deal with this task. First, Heidegger's early work on the phenomenology of religion and the Christian religion is for historical reasons, for Heidegger the point of departure for a reflection on religion. But the actual hermeneutic phenomenological description of this religious experience is anything but a one-sided affirmation. It is instead a critical interpretation of texts belonging to this tradition. And its aim is to contribute to a particular philosophical anthropology and a particular version of phenomenology. The second resource might be the early stages of recurse turn to hermeneutics. And then I mean, especially the period in the 1960s when a transition takes place in his work from the symbolism of evil um, to his first conceptions of hermeneutics. What intrigues me in recurse approach is that the turn to hermeneutics has become necessary by the critical predecessors of the first line of critique. Recur approaches these critiques as forms of interpretation that conflict with interpretations offered by the phenomenology of religion. And the hermeneutic turn creates the platform in which this conflict can play out and the respective contributions of these interpretations to a sense of the human self can be assessed. And both approaches, Heidegger's as well as Ricoeur's, offer indications of how a phenomenology of religion, when it is willing to be hermeneutical, might engage with the claims of religious experience concerning the human self and the world, as well as with its critiques. Um, and for the sake of time, in what follows, I will focus mainly on Heidegger's phenomenology of religion and make one brief, but I think important reference to, uh, to Ricoeur. Um, <clears throat> so let's turn to Heidegger and the reflection on religion and the sense of religious experience goes at the heart of the work of the early Heidegger. It is an interesting historical fact that because of Heidegger's personal engagement and struggle with religion, Husserl assigns him the task of developing a phenomenology of religion. And at first sight, this reads as a regional task namely the task to analyze the invariant eidetic structures of the particular re region of consciousness related to religion. However, Heidegger's findings seem to imply, at least for himself, a profound critique of certain motive, motives and presuppositions, um, motives, I should say, and presuppositions in the method of phenomenology as such. One of these presuppositions concerns exactly the question of the self and the subject. So at this point, um, his phenomenology overlaps with questions concerning a philosophical anthropology. And I want to show this while trying to avoid technical details as much as possible to contrast uh, a lecture series by Heidegger from 1923-24, Einführung in die Phänomenologische Forschung, Introduction in Phenomenological uh, Research, with his lectures in the summer term of 1921, uh, which aim to unearth the specific Christian religious experience of life at stake in St. Augustine. Let me say immediately that the lecture series from 23, 24 uh, is not an exercise in the phenomenology of religion. Rather, Heidegger attempts to clarify his own approach to phenomenology and contrast it with Husserl. And in this lecture series, two intrinsically related issues are at stake, namely that of history and that of the Cartesian heritage embraced by Husserl concerning the Cartesian form of the self or the subject as ego cogito. And just to, to, to get the stakes, I think, of Heidegger's phenomenology of religion clear, it might be good to state in a couple, in three statements, what is at stake for Heidegger in this um, exploration of the Cartesian background of certain forms of phenomenology. So I will first do that and then turn to the more directly uh, phenomenological uh, exercise or examination of religion. 
So three statements. First, in Heidegger's analysis of Descartes' cogito argument, the first thing that stands out is the quite sharp distinction that Heidegger makes between two elements. Heidegger affirms the basic experience of the self from which Descartes would depart, thinking cogitare is always, and I quote, cogitare me cogitare. Cogitare is, and I quote again, a peculiar being, sein, so not sein, whose manner of being is in how it has itself along with, and as wie des sich mit habens, end of quote. This evident experience of having oneself um, is affirmed by Heidegger. Yet this experience is not yet a form of certain knowledge. And in order to emphasize that this direct experience does not concern scientific knowledge, Heidegger uses the term having, which has a technical meaning. It denotes here a relation of the I directly experiencing itself. Heidegger objects, however, to Descartes' attempt to transform this experience into an object of knowledge, or better still, into a judgment that is absolutely certain and true, so that it can be used as the absolute point of departure for a project oriented to obtain knowledge in a methodolog methodological way. So this sharp distinction proposed by Heidegger can perhaps best be captured in terms of the specific care that according to Heidegger motivates Descartes' project. Rather than a genuine care for the self ignited and manifested in the primordial experience of having oneself, as Heidegger uses the term, Descartes' project is motivated by a care for knowledge and certainty. And this emphasis on certainty and knowledge is actually, as Heidegger puts it, eine Sorge der Beruhigung, a care that tranquilizes, and perhaps in order to bring out the tension with the Augustinian experience of the self, we could perhaps translate die Sorge der Beruhigung as the care that set, sets one's heart at rest, yeah? and hence avoids the experience of the inquietum est cor nostru. So second um, point that I want to make, second statement regarding Heidegger's reading of Descartes, the sense of the restlessness, or the sense of restlessness and inquietude is for Heidegger most clearly experienced as soon as we face the historicality of our experiences and concepts. Heidegger's lecture series in 23-24 gives us a striking analysis in this regard that shows how the experience of this historicality go accords with his hermeneutical method. And this brings into play a second line of his argumentation. To take one's point of departure in the cogito as discovered by Descartes, uh, we are actually inheriting an ahistorical Descartes, Heidegger suggests. And this is to remain blind to the historical conditions um, that also of possibility of Descartes' approach itself. And Heidegger nicely illustrates this uh, with uh, Descartes' meditation, which seem to display a particular split between the first two meditations and the ones that follow. Whereas the first two emphasize the discovery of the ego cogito, the ones that follow return to a more medieval or scholastic conception of reality in terms of causality. Yet for Heidegger, the whole enterprise of Descartes becomes incomprehensible if we do not see the intrinsic connection between these two phases of the meditations and by which we recognize the scholastic provenance of the meditations. And one of the motifs that Heidegger aims to bring out is the following. In a conception of reality in which God is understood according to the principle of causality as the creator of all beings, including the human being, the orientation of the human towards God and towards the truth is inscribed into the very entity that the human being is, as ens creatum. This means that the orientation towards God and the possibility to access the truth is simply a given. It is given with one's existence. 
Any human disorientation is simply the consequence of a failure on the part of the human to properly use the capacities given from the outset. Hence, there is already a sense of tranquilization in the self-experience of the human being when placed in the context of this scholastic ontology, departing from the idea of causality and making. And just between brackets, if one likes banners, one could also simply say that ontotheology, as, as the term that Heidegger develops, leads to a particular conception of the human being. And in this particular context, Descartes, and this is Heidegger's argument, presents us with an intensification of this motif when truth is understood in terms of certainty. And before turning to Augustine, uh, allow me one comment on the method and the methodological aim of this hermeneutical analysis. By disclosing the historical provenance of the modern conception of the human self or subject, a particular inquietude with respect to our own conceptions of this human self arises, which now appear to be historical rather than universal. And so the methodological gesture might awaken a new care of the self. And this is what Heidegger is doing in this text, aiming to bring us back to the primordial experience of the self, which apparently got lost in the course of the transformation of the self into an object of knowledge. So you see here that the goals and the orientation of a philosophical anthropology change by this repositioning of phenomenology towards a more hermeneutic framework. Okay, let's start making in the third statement the, the movement to Augustine and can deal with more directly uh, with the phenomenology of religion at stake in Heidegger. What does it have to do, what I said so far uh, with Augustine? Well, there is one striking remark in Heidegger's text that immediately brings Augustine to mind as the one offering an alternative to Descartes. And to characterize the Cartesian intensification of the scholastic account of the human, Heidegger concludes, and I quote, what presents itself here is an extreme Pelagianism of theoretical knowing. The suggestion speaking from this quote is clear. Augustine, whom we sometimes understand as the philosopher providing the first versions of the arguments developed by Descartes, appears here as providing a fundamentally different sense of the human self. And this sense results from a proper religious experience of the self that Heidegger tries to trace in his reading of Augustine a couple of years earlier in the summer term of 1921. And in this course, Heidegger reads book 10 of the Confessiones, and he reads it as the articulation of a religious experience of the self and of God. Um, and this basic self-experience that Heidegger aims at and that he tries to unfold in his reading may be found in another famous Augustinian phrase as opposed to the certainty that Descartes finds in the ego cogito, Augustine offers the experience of mihi quaestio factus sum. I have become a question to myself. Interestingly, just again between brackets as a side remark, in Hannah Arendt's The Life of the Mind, in the part on willing, this particular phrase exemplifies the discovery of the inner man in the history of Western thought. Heidegger, however, emphasizes that this is a properly religious experience of the self, accentuated also by Augustine, because the phrase is preceded by in cuius oculis, before your eyes, that is, before the eyes of God, I have become a question to myself. And rather than certainty, the self-relation that takes shape in the religious experience of God is marked by a particular inquietude a continuous questioning rather than a certain foundation. So let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into Heidegger's reading of Augustine. And perhaps it is good to start with a methodological concern. As I said, phenomenology concerned, hermeneutic phenomenology concerns both methods and content. To engage with the religious experience at stake in the Augustinian text does not mean that 
one simply hands oneself over or fully entrusts oneself uncritically to this text. I think that Heidegger's reading of Augustine exemplifies what he calls destruction, which in English is probably best translated as deconstruction or dismantling, as long as we keep in mind the difference with the more Derridian version of deconstruction. For Heidegger, Augustine is an example of an author who expresses a Christian religious experience of life and of the self in a vocabulary that is not always fully up to the task, since this vocabulary is itself marked by ancient Greek philosophical forms of expression. And this is a characteristic concern in the early Heidegger. We can pose all kinds of questions with it, but it's important to follow this, I think, for, to see what he's doing in his reading of Augustine. It is this concern that Heidegger uses when approaching the tension between religious experience on the one hand and the philosophical modes of expression it found in the course of history. Uh, to summarize, we might say that Heidegger sees, and this is very short summary, uh, summary, we might say that Heidegger sees the Greek philosophical approach as strongly motivated by a care for knowledge rather than a care for the self. Now, of course, if we look back at this reading from Foucault's analysis of Hellenistic thought, of course, a different picture might arise. But this is the point of departure uh, that, uh, that, that Heidegger takes. And especially the Neoplatonist motifs in Augustine's work tend to hide or obfuscate the other motif, namely the religious experience of the self. Now, this deconstruction of the Augustinian text has a particular goal, namely to clear the way to access this experience. One may challenge Heidegger on many points, for instance, on his characterization of ancient Greek thought. However, one should always be aware of one thing, namely that this deconstruction is not concerned with criticizing or correcting, in this case, Augustine. The deconstruction is a necessity stemming from the present. And so Heidegger explicitly says that I'm not trying to correct Aristotle, I'm not trying to correct Augustine, but I want to get access to a certain experience that is not so easy to access from the present. That's why a deconstruction is needed. In Heidegger's case, this present is marked by a particular Cartesian influence that has deepened the stronghold of expressions that are in the service of a care for theoretical knowledge, and which, therefore, and in which, therefore, the experience at stake in Augustine is buried even deeper. Hence, it is out of a present concern that a deconstruction of the Augustinian text is necessary, so that the experience of the self at stake in it can announce itself to a present audience. So it's not about undoing the religious experience, deconstruction in Heidegger, but rather about undoing present day obstructions, so that this experience might manifest itself and become understandable in a present sense. Thus, the engagement with the text demands a detachment from both the present day predicament and the particular Augustinian articulations <clears throat> that might hide this experience from our view. In this sense, Heidegger's phenomenology of religion is itself critical, marked by deconstruction, but with a particular goal, to allow us to interpret and explicate and thus engage with the experience articulated in the Augustinian text. It is a critical reading concerned with finding an approach to the text that allows it to speak to us in a new way about its genuine subject matter, namely the religious experience expressed in it. And at this point, I want to make a brief reference to Ricoeur and Ricoeur's methodological approach, which is close to and at the same time significantly different from uh, Heidegger's. Ricoeur also repositions his phenomenology in a hermeneutic way in order to allow a particular tension between what he calls trust and suspicion to be played out in the different interpretations that can be given of religious texts and experiences. In a very broad sense, Ricoeur seems to allow for two approaches to or types of the religious text. The first one, based on the reader's trust in the significance of what the text has to say, readers fully entrust themselves to the text. 
It is approached as a text that has something significant to say to the readers about their own existence and their role in the world. They consider and reinterpret their lives in light of the religious experience conveyed by the text. The other approach developed by the so-called masters of suspicion, and they are, I think, in a way, predecessors of the critiques of the phenomenology of religion, especially as elaborated in the first two lines of the critique from the statement. This approach is marked by distrust. The religious text is about gaining power, imposing ideology, worldviews, and so on. In this approach, the interpreters do not place themselves in the light of what a text might disclose about self and world, but the text is rather approached as something that needs to be deciphered or deconstructed in order to bring to light the ideology or worldviews ingrained in it and the disciplining or overpowering effects wrought on by it. And what Ricoeur aims to do in his approach of a hermeneutics in terms of a conflict of interpretation is the following. While acknowledging the fundamental conflict between these two forms of interpreting, it is the task of philosophy to try to develop dialectic relations between these forms of interpreting, even, they, even though they do not allow for an ultimate or final form of reconciliation. Clearly, Ricoeur and Heidegger articulate their hermeneutic approaches in significantly different ways. And with respect to Ricoeur's position, I admit I'm always worried a little bit that one moves away too much from the experience and gets entangled in the complexities of language to such an extent that one does not return to the experience itself. And the dialectic can go on forever. Nevertheless, Ricoeur and Heidegger seem to share the conviction that the repetition or the retrieval in the strong sense of Heidegger's Wiederholung of a religious experience requires critique. And this might be an important correction of the types of critique that seem to suggest that critique renders such a repetition or retrieval impossible. Deconstruction is rather an integral part of the possibility of retrieving the experience or sense articulated in the religious text, because this experience, as well as its understanding, whether in its trusting or suspicious form, is always historical. There is a tendency in the one-sided critical approach, and the recruiter explicitly notes this with respect to the masters of suspicion and the structuralist versions with which he is engaging in the 1960s to dehistoricize itself. That is to say, while that which is criticized, for instance, religion, can be criticized because of its social, cultural, and historical dimensions, the critical point of view itself seems to be lacking the awareness of its own finitude, be it socially, culturally, or historically. Okay, um, after this long comment on methods, uh, let me also say, try to say a little bit more about content. A few comments on the content of Heidegger's turn to Augustine. And so what type of religious experience is at stake there for him? What is intriguing is that he is struck, Heidegger is struck, by the important change of perspective that appears in Augustine's analysis of memory in Book 10 of the Confessionals. And he argues that this change guides and reorients its whole enterprise, at least of Book 10. We know the context. Augustine is looking for God, and he concludes that he cannot find God as an object in the external world. Therefore, he turns inward, aiming to locate God in his memory. In each of these stages, Heidegger suggests, there is not yet a real self-relation at stake or experienced. Rather, God is approached as object, not discernible in the outside sensuous world, so it must be somewhere in memory. Yet, rather than actually finding God somewhere inside, the analysis that Augustine offers brings the self into view at the very moment that it turns inward to memory because Augustine then experiences himself as searching for God. And this experience implies a crucial shift of orientation. Searching for or finding something implies self-involvement. Therefore, neither can be reduced to the objective presence of this thing. Uh, if I'm searching for a thing, 
The thing might have been present before I found it, lying on the same place during my searching and finding. So finding it does not change anything in this objective presence. However, when I find a particular thing, I was first looking for it. That means that I already have this thing in one way or another when searching it, although I have it differently than when I have found it. Consequently, how I have this thing cannot be understood in terms of the thing's objective presence. The emphasis shifts, hence the emphasis in Augustine's analysis shifts from God as object to the searching of God as a particular way of having God, that is to a particular self-relation to God in which one also experiences oneself, namely as searching and more precisely as searching for God. And the experience of self and God in the searching attests to a particular self-concern, bekümmerung, quite a strong word in German, which perhaps might be very concisely phrased as it is only in searching God, this particular mode of having God, that I truly have myself, or phrased negatively, not searching for God means losing oneself. And Augustine's descriptions of the temptations and the troubles, the molestia of life, that follow in Book 10, serve to show that life is a continual testing. And what is tested is nothing less than itself's perseverance in its search for God. And the three forms of dispersion or deflection that Augustine describes, the concupiscentia carnis, the concupiscentia oculorum, and the ambitio saecoli, imply that each of our everyday activities can be enacted in two ways, either in search of God or in forgetfulness of God and thus self-loss. Therefore, the genuine focus shifts towards the enactment of them. How do we use them? How do we know? How do we live among our fellow humans? Do we enact them in search of God or not? Hence, in each of these three dispersions, the lights we take in the beings around us that we hear, see or smell, the pleasure of objectively knowing things, or the self-appreciation we feel when our fellow humans praise us, human life is marked by the continuous real danger of self-loss. Yeah, that is, of losing ourselves in these delights, pleasures, of knowing or received praises. This possibility is always given and marks the specific restlessness of one's self-relation. Yeah, there is no assurance or guarantee in the human self itself that the human pers can persevere. And this is exactly opposite to the Cartesian use of the ontotheological model in which the human capacity to attain truth and have it as certainty is built upon the self-certainty that the ego would be. Because there is no assurance in the self itself, the experience of the self subsequently refers to a particular Christian experience of grace or of dependence, if you like, which might be the religious form of experiencing contingency. And along these lines, Heidegger interprets Augustine's statement in Book 10 that before your eyes I have become a question to myself. And for Augustine, <clears throat> religious life is involved in a radical self-concern before God, as Heidegger writes. So let me interrupt my uh, reading here. Uh, that it would be easy to make all kinds of connections also to Heidegger's reading of St. Paul that I think fits very nicely with this reading of Augustine in, in which he tries to unearth how the self-relation that he's aiming at, and hence the particular mode of phenomenology, can only be developed in terms of or in conversation with the phenomenology of religion. And I hope that the example of Heidegger reading Augustine offers ways of developing a hermeneutic phenomenology of religion as a critical tool with respect to certain conceptions of the human, as well as a critical reading of religious documents that aims at retrieving a particular religious experience of the self, thus showing the impact and import of a phenomenology of religion for philosophical anthropology. Thank you for your attention.